turn to Luke chapter 15, at least in some of the Pew Bibles, that is on page 778. The reading of God's Word is always a high priority in this church. Read along as I read out loud here. Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him, but the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed the pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up, and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him, and he ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring on his, put a ring on his finger and put, it on, put a ring on his fingers and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, All these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found." I'm pretty sure that I have told you the story of Prodigal Sunday. Jennifer and I visited a church in the South many years ago, and the sermon that day was a dramatic retelling of this, one of the most famous of Jesus' parables, with the preacher as the father in the story, and I think it was a young deacon playing the role of the lost son. They quarreled. The father took a wad of cash out and gave it to the young man who walked off the side out a door and we heard a motorcycle rev up and take off out of the parking lot. And then the preacher sat in a rocking chair and told the story 
more in ordinary preacher fashion until he looked toward the back of the sanctuary and said, Ethel, our boy is back. And all eyes turned to the back where the young man walked in, barefoot, clothes torn, dripping mud with every step up the aisle. The pastor went down, met him halfway up the aisle. They embraced, and when they separated, the pastor's suit was muddy from shoulders to knees. And maybe I was too sophisticated for my own good or too something or other because uh, this did not really move me. I thought the whole thing seemed a little corny, but I must have been the minority because people everywhere were weeping openly, moved by this fresh telling of the old, old story. Well, this morning I'm going to, with you, look at the parable of the lost son and the prodigal God through the lens of scholarship. Nothing quite so dramatic as what we observed in Tennessee that day, but rather listening to experts in first century Palestine, Israel, peasant culture to see what fresh light they might be able to shed on this familiar tale. <laughs> right about now, somebody's thinking, oh shucks. Uh, Prodigal Sunday sounds more interesting. Motorcycle and mud versus the lens of scholarship. Uh, but I can only tell you that I have personally had my eyes opened in a fresh way to this familiar text by listening to one scholar in particular who lived his whole adult life in the Middle East, read the Bible, as a native and is able to help us see things in this parable that we might not otherwise see. You'll find it helpful, I'm sure, to have your Bible open to Luke 15. We won't look at the whole chapter that Dale read, but just this third of the parables in Luke 15. The story opens with a shocking request. Verse 12, the young boy said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between the two sons. Now even in our Western culture, we handle with care and sensitivity the need to discuss our inheritance with our parents. Maybe when they're old and ill, we have to ask them what arrangements have been made, if their will is up to date. But we do it with care because we don't want to come across as sounding like, when you die, what's in it for me? But in that culture, in particular, a request like this was scandalous. Kenneth Bailey, my go-to scholar for this passage, said that he has asked people over the years if such a request uh, might possibly be made even today in the Middle East, and the conversation typically goes like this. Has anyone ever made such a request in your village? Never. Could anyone ever make such a request? Impossible. If anyone ever did, what would happen? Well, his father would beat him, of course. Why? The request means he wants his father to die. And Bailey says that in the literally hundreds of times he has asked this question, only twice has he received a positive answer. In one case, a, a man was asked by his older son if he could have his share of the inheritance, and his father drove him out of the house and out of the village. In another case, the younger son asked for his share of the inheritance, and the father was so heartbroken that, according to his wife, he died a few days later of a broken heart. And yet, in Jesus' story, the father agrees to the son's request. The boy turns his inheritance into cash and goes off to Vegas. Now, many a retelling of this story dwells on what happened next. We are treated to lurid 
titillating details of how the boy spent his years a fleshing out of that one little phrase, he squandered his wealth in wild living. But it's worth noting that for Jesus' original audience, the truly shocking thing had already happened. It almost didn't matter where the prodigal went or how he lived. He had grossly insulted his father, broken his parents' heart, left his community, forsaken his true home. And so Jesus doesn't have to paint a detailed picture of the sun in the far country, the listeners are already shaking their heads and clucking their tongues over the scandalous behavior before he ever gets to Vegas. You see, sin is not only sensuality, it's separation from the Father. Sin not only breaks our king's laws, it breaks our father's heart. Sin not only gets you in trouble with the judge, it estranges you from the one who loves you most. The wages of sin is not only a sentence imposed by heaven's court, but a tragically squandered life in the far country. Well, verse 14 says that after the young man had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. Historians identify 10 significant famines in the 250 years leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. So, on average, there was a serious famine in every generation. Jesus' listeners got it. They, they knew something about famine. Not just a downturn in the economy, not a little bit of bite t uh, belt tightening, but, but lots of people going hungry. And this young man with no money, no father, no friends, no community, hires himself out to a man feeding pigs. <laughs> so for a Jewish boy, he has hit bottom. Over the years, I have sometimes prayed for someone who was not walking with God, someone I cared about, and prayed, Lord, do whatever you have to do to bring him back to yourself. And then almost immediately thinking, I hope that that is not too bad. I hope God doesn't have to bring the one I'm praying for to where the lost son was. Well, the boy doesn't really know his father's heart. He knows that he has to go back because he doesn't really have any choices but maybe to starve to death. And he doesn't think that his father will accept him back as a son, maybe not even as a servant. He, he knows the magnitude of his offense. He knows that he has no right to expect anything from his father or from his village except for shame and rejection. But he goes because he doesn't have any choice. And meanwhile, what's the father been doing? Well, he's been looking down the road out of the village a lot. He's been taking his wallet out and looking at his son's picture a lot. When the older brother comes in from working in the fields, he finds dad sometimes distracted, staring out the window. Well, verse 20 the young man got up, went to his father. While he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. 
The experts tell us that an oriental patriarch never runs. Aristotle said great men never run in public. To do so is humiliating. One student of the culture heard about a pastoral candidate who was not accepted as pastor of the church because the elders felt like he walked down the street too fast. And yet this father in Jesus' story runs to meet the boy. The son expected that uh, he would face the hostile stares of the villagers, probably their taunts and jeers, but the father runs that gauntlet for him. You know, it's been said that there is no need for the atonement in the parable of the prodigal son. That is, there's nothing here about the necessity of sacrifice. The father, simply out of a heart full of mercy, forgives his son. And so liberal theologians say, well, we need to listen to Jesus and not the Apostle Paul and all his legal talk about justification and propitiation and the need for a substitute. Let's just trust that God is merciful and will forgive anyone who wants to be forgive, forgiven. There's no need for the cross. But you know, grace is costly. Mercy is costly. It costs to release your right and to forgive freely someone who has wronged you. It, it, it's not just a warm sentiment, this love and grace and mercy that we read about in the Bible. It is a painful self-giving. And the doctrine of the cross is this, that on Calvary, God himself suffered the shame, the embarrassment, the cost of his encounter with sinners and ran to reconcile us to himself. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Well, the Father's moving demonstration of love and grace and mercy melts the boy's heart. He does not complete his prepared speech. In verse 21, he says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But he doesn't say anything about coming on staff as one of the slaves there's no place for pride or earning anything in this scene. All he can do is accept his father's unmerited grace. Now, the father loved him when he was still at home. The father loved him when he was in the far country. But the boy didn't really realize how much the father loved him until he saw the father paying the cost and running the gauntlet for him. And it is still true today that a lot of people do not recognize the love of God in the way he blesses them year in and year out, day in and day out, in a myriad of ways. But when they grasp finally what he did for them in the person of Jesus on the cross, then, then they get it. God really does love me. So the father embraces him. Now the villagers won't understand this. The Pharisees listening to Jesus tell the story won't understand it. He's got the smell of pigs on him. He's got Gentile rags on him. The father says, let me get my arms around him. They put my ring on him, my robe on him, my shoes on him, marks of status, of acceptance. Kill the fatted calf. Not the lamb or the goat. We're going to need a lot of meat because everybody in the county is going to be invited to this party. 
The story is known as the parable of the prodigal son, but you know, in a sense, it really is the story of a prodigal God. Prodigal not only means excessively wasteful or reckless, it can mean exceedingly generous. And don't we have here a picture of a father, a God who is exceedingly merciful, exceedingly gracious, who treats as sons and daughters people who don't even deserve to be treated as servants. And then there is in this story an often underlooked, overlooked gesture of grace toward the older brother. For him to stay outside sulking, refusing to come in, was an insult to his father, scarcely less pointed than the insult that his younger brother had committed. He had semi-official duties on this occasion. He was supposed to mingle with the guests, instruct the servants, see to it that his father's guests were fed and had plenty to drink. And if he had a quarrel with his father, he could have waited to discuss it until later, but instead he makes a scene, bringing again, for the second time in the day, shame on the father. There's an interesting story about a sheik in the Middle East who learns that the flood protecting his village's valley from destruction is weak and is about to break. And he knows that if he lets everybody else in on this secret, their property values will plummet. So he, um, he arranges an excuse to sell his land and get out of town. He has a big feast, like the one Jesus is talking about, invites all the important people of the community to the feast, and has arranged in advance for his son to insult him. And the father says, I'm going to kill him. And the guests all plead with him, no, 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 don't kill him. And he says, okay, I won't kill him, but I cannot possibly remain in a village where I have been publicly insulted by my son. And so he sells his land for a good price and moves before the dam breaks. Now, the point, of course, is that in that culture, for a son to insult his father publicly at a banquet is almost unthinkable. And if such an insult could be a credible pretext for a sheik getting out of town, then Jesus' hearers would have felt the force of the older brother's behavior. And they expect the father to rebuke him, or at least go on with the party without him. But no, no, for the second time today, the father leaves the house and offers, in public humiliation, unexpected gesture of love. He pleads with his older son, don't be angry. Don't sulk. Come in. And his doing so is as much an act of grace as his acceptance of the lost younger son. He could have said to the younger son, you disgusting drunken reprobate, clean up your life and then maybe we can talk about your coming home. And he could have said to the older son, you self-righteous prig. Stay outside then. Forever, for all I care. You can go to hell. But he didn't. God loves older brothers too. He loves prodigals and Pharisees. He loves prostitutes and priests. He's indiscriminating in his love, prodigal in his grace, unwilling that any should perish in the far country or on the back porch. He wants everybody by his side. Well, notice this older son's response in verse 29. 
He answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you, never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. And when this son of yours, not my brother, this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fatted calf for him. He demonstrates the spirit of a slave, not a son. I've worked, where's mine? Accuses his father of favoritism and meanness. And he's estranged from his brother. And as estranged from his father as his brother, even though he never left the home. And still, his father appeals to him. My son, verse 31. You're always with me. Everything I have is yours, which is to say, I'm not going to take your share of the inheritance and give it to your brother. Everything I have is coming to you. It's already yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead. He's alive again. He was lost. Now he's found. You can try to read those words in an angry tone, but it just doesn't work. They are as gracious as any lines in Luke 15. Well, does the father's appeal soften the older brother's heart? We don't know. Jesus leaves the story unfinished, or rather for the Pharisees to finish, and for you to finish. Will you pray with me? What good news there is in this parable, Father, for unworthy us, prodigals or older brothers. And although with the help of scholars who know a whole lot more than I do, I've tried to bring the story to life and some fresh perspective on it. I know very well that only the Holy Spirit can move in hearts in such a way that they come to the altar where the Father's arms are open wide. And although I know that I'm preaching primarily to people who have already embraced the good news, and for us this is just a fresh reminder of how much you love us, chances are that there are some here today who have yet to receive this incredible gift of prodigal grace. And if you would be pleased to use the hymns and the prayers and the preaching and the reading of your word to bring some to faith in Christ today, we would be so grateful. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake.